Well, the discovery that Tomb of King Tutankhamun, it is one of the great, great stories, one of the great adventure stories in archaeology. And also now that we've been in the tomb, to really give you an appreciation of what a big deal this was, because we all know about King Tut and all the Tut mania over the years. So there's a good reason all of this stuff really took off. So this is what the excavators saw, Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon, when they discovered the tomb in 1922. People had never seen anything like this. We'll come back to this picture. But it was like Fibber McGee's closet from 3,000 years ago, just completely <laughs> jammed full of thousands and thousands of objects. The tomb, as you know, is in the Valley of the Kings. We were here just a couple days ago. Uh, this is before they moved the, um, the visitor center. So the tomb is right about in here. And there's an interesting history about the discovery of the tomb. In the early 1900s, a rich American industrialist, Theodore Davis, who made his money in iron, as so many early American magnates did, was working for a long time in the Valley of the Kings. He was the major explorer. Uh, here he is shown with a very interesting guy, Egyptologist Arthur Weigel and um, Mrs., uh, Mrs. Davis. A very successful man in the Valley of the Kings. As was typical of this period, he was not a professional archaeologist. He was a magnate. He was interested in doing things. He was a hobbyist with a whole bunch of money. And so, he had, but he had very good intentions. And so he hired Weigel, a professional Egyptologist, archaeologist, to actually do the work for him. But Davis was very much on the site all the time. And boy, did they have a lot of success. For example, they discovered the tomb of Horemheb, the successor of Tutankhamun, one of the spectacular tombs. Very, very deep tomb. This was not open when we were there. Fantastic color preserved. They discovered the tomb of Tuoseret, which was uh, another tomb which was not open. As, as you know, they are open and closed tombs, but spectacular tombs. And in about 19, oh, let's say about 1915, he was working in an area of the Valley of Kings, not too far from where the Tutankhamun tomb was discovered in 1922. And he discovered a pit, and in this pit were a bunch of enormous white jars. These jars are like Alibaba jars. They're about four feet tall. And when he opened them, they were found to contain lots and lots of other dishes. This is material in our museum at the Oriental Institute that came from this find. And he was very disappointed. Because, of course, he wanted a tomb, but what he found is a whole bunch of pottery. And this isn't exactly what he was looking for. But it was very, very important because there were some little shreds of papyrus that had the name Tutankhamun on them. And there was also, in one of these jars, was a small gold mask, small gold funerary mask that looks like either very high elite or royalty. So because of some of this material did have the name Tutankhamun on it, he assumed he had discovered the completely robbed tomb of Tutankhamun. That this tomb had been so destroyed in ancient times that this was at all that were remained of the tomb. So in fact, he published this group of pottery and little bits and pieces as the tomb of King Tutankhamun. Shortly afterward, he gave up, gave up in the Valley of the Kings, declaring very famously, the Valley of the Kings is now exhausted. And he gave up his exclusive rights to work in the Valley of the Kings. And very shortly afterward, that concession, that license, was snapped up by Howard Carter, a British archaeologist we mentioned several times when we were in Luxor. His funding was the same kind of arrangement. He was working for a wealthy British man, Lord Carnarvon, who lived at uh, the house that Downton Abbey is being filmed in. That's Carnarvon's residence. And so Carter and Carnarvon set off in this, what many people thought was a fool's, um, a fool's goal, because Davis had really looked at a lot of the valley, found nothing, and so these guys said, "Okay, we're going to we're going to give it another try." They found little bits of gold foil, again with the name Tutankhamun, but really nothing that was a very exciting. Now C Carter has a very long story in Egypt. He started, as I mentioned to some of you, as an artist when he was a young man. He was taken to Egypt. He was a fine art student. And he did some of the really wonderful documentation of the Temple of Hatshepsut. These are some of the watercolors he did of that temple. Really gorgeous things. In fact, some of these just recently showed up at auction houses. It was incredible. 
but there's still some of them in circulation. So here we have the team. Here's Howard Carter, his financial patron, Lord Carnarvon, uh, Carnarvon's niece, uh, Lady Evelyn, uh, Lady Evelyn, and uh, then other scientists part, part of the team. So they started working, and they worked, and they worked, and they worked, and they worked for something like six years and found basically nothing. Finally, in 1922, Carnarvon <laughs> told Carter that he just couldn't support this anymore. It was just, well, it wasn't proving anything. They had very systematically gone through the, through the Valley of the Kings. And in 1922, Carnarvon told Carter, okay, this is the last season. We've really tried, we've found nothing. Davis was probably right. And so 1922 will be the last season that I will fund this excavation. And so Carter was really on the spot. And this is Hollywood, it sounds like Hollywood, but it's not. The last scheduled day of the excavation, they found a hole in the desert. So they just found this, and they started excavating it, and they found a series of 16 stairs. These the stairs, we went down, they're metal stairs on top of these now to protect them. And they got to the bottom of the stairs, and there was a door covered with, it was locked up and sealed, and it was covered with seal impressions, these ovals look like cartouches. You see the Anubis and nine chapters. This is the official seal of the royal necropolis. So they knew they had a royal tomb. The question was, whose tomb? And also, was it intact? So they started looking at this big sealed doorway. And it happened to be that James Henry Breasted, the founder of the Oriental Institute, was in Luxor. He's a great expert in Egyptian um, material. And so they invited him to come look at the ceilings on the door. This is the way archaeologists worked in that period. This is lunch. This is lunch break while they're working on Tutankhamun. And so here is our founder, James Henry Breasted. Here is Howard Carter. Uh, Lord Carnarvon is not in the photograph. This is the great linguist, uh, Henry Cudd, uh, Alan Gardner, but uh, the love of the phony chairs and the, and the servants. So Breston did a very s careful study of the, of the ceilings on the doorway and figured out that the tomb certainly had been open, so it was not an intact tomb. He could see one set of seals uh, resealing with a different set of seals, but he could tell that the seals were chronologically not that far apart, but clearly somebody had been in the tomb at least once, if not twice. So they had no idea what was going to be behind this door. It could mean nothing. They made a hole in the doorway, and this is so well documented. It's one of the, the, the if you're interested in archaeological stories, the, this reads so well. Carter and Mace, one of his colleagues, wrote this fabulous book, The Discovery of the Tomb of Tutankhamun. So they made a little hole in that doorway and stuck a candle through it. And Carnarvon, standing behind Carter, said, do you see anything? Some of the most famous words in archaeology. Carter says, yes, wonderful things. So you have to imagine them having no idea what's there. They're looking through this little hole, and this is what they're seeing through the flickering of the light. Something that nobody had ever seen before. There had been no intact tombs of royalty found in ancient Egypt. So this was unbelievable. So in fact, I misspoke. Carnarvon was not there at the time. So actually, Carter, being very responsible, had sealed up the, uh, the stairway Carter and uh, cabled Carnarvon to come back to Egypt immediately. So there was this very anxious waiting time until Carnarvon, Carnarvon could come back to be there for the official opening of the tomb. Now, this is spectacular black and white photography, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But we're used to seeing color photography, so it's really hard to get a sense of how incredible this scene must look. So for example, what we have here, these are very tall wooden funerary beds. The, the backs of them are about this big. Cases for mummified food, furniture, all sorts of stuff. So if you look at this bed, this is what it looks like in color. Yeah. It's covered in gold with black a decoration. So if you can imagine everything in that room in color, it would be just incredible. Or for example, uh, there's a little stool down here. This is what it looks like. 
Those of you who saw one of the two on comic shows, this school has actually toured the United States. It's a spectacular piece made of ebony and ivory. Now, one of the reasons this tomb is so, so famous is not only the contents, but the documentation of this tomb. What happened is when Carter made this discovery, he realized this was one of the biggest discoveries ever made in Egypt, and he needed a lot of help. So he assembled a scientific mission, but he also needed a very, very good photographer. And the man you see on the left is Harry Burton, who was the official photographer for the Metropolitan Museum of Art, who was a big presence in Luxor at the beginning of the 20th century. If you remember when we were at the Hatshepsut Temple off to the left, if you were facing the temple off the left, it was this really great early 1900s big house. That's the Metropolitan Museum's field mission that they had built for their excavations. So Harry, uh, Harry Burton was seconded to the Tutankhamun team to take photographs. And it's incredibly lucky because Harry Burton was not an ordinary archaeological photographer. He was trained as a fine arts photographer. And this really shows in the photography for this tomb. Uh, the compositions, the lighting, for example, here, a set of horse blinkers, just a very simple piece of, uh, of equipment for horses, beautifully, beautifully, but beautifully arranged. These are gold with bright colored glass inlay. And of course, this was the, the era of black and white, so it's all black and white, but it really is beautiful, beautiful photography. Now, if you remember, the tomb is very, very small. We walked down the stairs that were covered with metal stair, and then we, there was a descending passageway. So there was a locked door here. This was completely filled up at the time they discovered the tomb. This was filled, and then there was another locked door there, and that's the one that they were looking at the seals to figure out who had been in and out of the tomb. So the first view, that wonderful things photograph, is looking straight this direction. When we were in the tomb, you remember the, the body of Coral King Tut was right over here? And we went over here and we could look into the burial chamber. So it's a very small tomb. It's only four chambers. This is not typical of royal tombs of this period at all. So this is probably not intended for a king. King Tut died unexpectedly. And his successor, I, probably just stuck him with whatever tomb was, was available because I's tomb is certainly much more royal style. And I was only on the throne a couple of years after Tut. So what we think happens is Tut, um, I grabbed Tut's tomb and stuck Tut in a non-royal tomb. But no matter. So it's four small chambers, the antechamber, the annex, the burial chamber, and the so-called treasury. Of course, all rock cut in the limestone. So some views of this room. We just looked at this. This is looking straight in from the stairway. This incredible group of, there are about five or 6,000 objects in this tomb in a tremendous state of disorder because it had been robbed. As I mentioned, it had been opened once or twice by robbers. And so what we think went on is the robbers came through and they just started throwing stuff around, trying to find, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, the specific things they wanted to steal. Presumably, priests or officials caught them in the act of robbing the tomb. I'll tell you why I think that is true. Got the robbers out of there, and they they tried to restore some order in the tomb by just pushing stuff against the wall, throwing stuff, just trying to make some room to be able to walk through and make sure everything was all right. So tremendous disorder. Now, look, if you're standing there, if you look to the right, you see a third of these huge funerary beds, fabulous furniture, uh, a chair that we'll look at, two great guardian statues. These are funerary bouquets that were carried at the time Tut was buried. So we know what time of the year he, was, he, was, uh, he died and was buried from the flowers that are in the funerary bouquets. If you look the other direction, here are the other of the beds. This is a big heap of chariots. These spectacular chariots. This is one of those beds. And here, a detail of the chariots. And you see that there's sort of lots of stuff all over the place. There were, I believe, six chariots in this one chamber and a couple in the other chamber. And this is what they look like, the Harry Burton photograph. Really beautiful wicker work. But this is what they look like in color and detail. Wow. Completely covered in gold with glass incrustation. Just really spectacular. And this is the kind of scene you're used to seeing now in Egypt. So here's Tut as a sphinx. We see he's trampling on a Nubian. And over here, this is a person from Levant with tied, he's, he's bound around his neck 
with the papyrus and lotus, the emblematic plants of ancient Egypt. So again, this iconic thing about the power of Egypt over their neighbors. So you have to imagine, just not only were the archaeologists seeing things that nobody had ever seen actual examples of, but there were three and four and five examples of many of these objects. Things like this, spectacular alabaster vases. This is one of them. Beautifully done. Uh, it is composed of a lot of hieroglyphs put together. So these are the emblematic, this is papyrus and lotus twine, uh, entwined around a hieroglyph, which means to be united. This is the onk sign, remember the onk sign? And dominion, so this says, may upper and lower Egypt be entwined in life and dominion for, this is years, for hundreds of thousands of years. So this whole vase can be, read, can be read. It's composed of all these hieroglyphs stuck together. So again, you know, they were seeing these incredible, incredible groups of material. Other sorts of material will come back to this. A spectacular little gold shrine. This was in, the, in several of the touch shows, so some of you may have actually seen this. But again, these, these things that we had never seen examples of. Now, the, from that chamber, you could look into the burial chamber. You remember, we were looking into the burial chamber. I'm sorry, I don't have this in color. But this is that wonderful scene that shows the transition of Tut from the time of his death to the time of him becoming associated with the god Osiris. So remember, this is his successor. The cartouches say King I, so the successor of Tut, the guy who buried Tut. So here he's dressed as a priest in the panther cloth. And this is a particular, it's an adze, a tool, that he's going to touch to the eyes, nose, and mouth of the mummy. So you see, this is the mummy of Tut, because his arms are like this. And by doing that, he will open the eyes, nose, and mouth for use in the afterlife. Then it's it's like a comic book, reading right to left. And here we have Tutankhamun, again, the cartouche. This is the goddess Newt, the sky goddess. And here she has hieroglyphs in her hands, which spell greeting. It's Nini, so she's greeting Tutankhamun with these hieroglyphs. And then the final scene, culmination of this is here's Tutankhamun embracing and being embraced by the god Osiris. Look, he's got his hand up actually up around his neck. This is Tutankhamun's spirit, or his ka. You see this, the arms on top of his head. So this shows very succinctly this transition between the moment of burial and the transformation of Tutankhamun into a form of Osiris. And of course, historically, this is very, very useful because there's no question who Tutankhamun's successor was because he's shown right here in the tomb. Now, on the right side of that, of the main chamber, when we were looking through this, uh, what, what was then a closed door into the burial chamber. So when Carter and Carnarvon had cleared a lot of the material from this antechamber, they turned their attention to the right here, to these two great statues. A lot of these photographs are beautifully staged. There's a lot of staging going on with these photographs because this is also one of the first tombs to really be uh, a uh, publicity sensation. Carter and Carnarvon were no dopes. Also, they signed an exclusive contract with the Illustrated London News. And so they were getting a lot of royalties from that. And so they're doing these spectacular photographs for public and press consumption. So again, this, stamp, this doorway it was covered with the stamps of the Royal Necropolis. Here are more rushes. Here is a basket that was actually put there for the photograph because Carter and Carnarvon were supposed to wait for the Egyptian officials to open that door. In fact, they made a hole down here to check and see if there was anything behind the wall. And so for the official photographs, they covered it up. And boy, was there stuff behind this wall. So they took the wall down. Howard Carter in his shirt sleeves, which is shocking, absolutely shocking. They took down the wall, and here what they were confronting was a solid wall of gold, of wood covered with gold. This is the first of four nested funerary shrines. Spectacular things. This is, a, again, a Harry Burton photograph with hieroglyphs. Some of you know this jet symbol for stability. This is different. So this thing is, this is the one that I referred to as being about the size of a two-car garage, like a maybe two Bugs. It's enormous. This is what it looks like in color. It's gold with lapis lazuli colored glass inlay. Very, very elegant. 
this is a a view of the side, the side of the shrine to the, so the shrine is to the left. This is the wall of the chamber. So you can see it almost completely occupied that particular chamber. This is pretty cool. These oars, the oars were laid there uh, in antiquity to help Tutankhamun navigate to the afterlife. Because if you've seen from the royal tombs, gods move in boats, so you need the oars. Now these numbers, this is part of the photographic process that Harry Burton Institute which is brilliant because there were so many things in the tomb. Before they touched anything, they would put a number by the object, by a bunch of the objects. They'd take a photograph, then they'd move the object with the number, do photography of that object by itself, and then put more numbers on the rest of the stack because they're moving down through these enormous stacks of artifacts. So these numbers are part of the photographic and documentation process. When they opened the this shrine, the top, they took the top off it, and they found inside of it was another wooden shrine covered with this incredible linen pole, this enormous piece of linen. And these are wood marguerites covered in sheet gold. So it was spangled with little, with, it's supposed to look like stars, but spangled with these wonderful gold uh, florals. And here's a, these, I mean, it's great. They really documented everything here. They are uh, working on that pole. They've taken it out of the tomb to document it. Well, Carter noticed that the first shrine, the one we've been looking at, the ceiling, so the door ceiling, was not intact. Somebody had been into that shrine. So again, he was like, well, we don't know what we're going to find here. He opened that shrine to find a second shrine. That also had the, uh, the seals were not intact. And so he was really afraid they were going to find, they were not going to find a, a more or less intact body of a tomb, body, body of the king. But the, he opened the second shrine, is a third shrine. This one, however, the seals were intact, just as they were left in about 350 BC. So here we have the original binding to, for the door leaves, and here the necropolis seal. He opened that third shrine and he found a fourth shrine. So it's four of these shrines, one inside another. It's very interesting. This was logistically very, very difficult because as you can see, these shrines basically filled the entire room. So they had to bring the pieces in separately and then construct them in the, uh, in the chamber and they screwed up. They got some of the pieces in reverse. And it's very interesting when you look at them, it actually says north, south, east, and west uh, on them in hieroglyphs and they got it completely screwed up and had to turn them around. And so he opened the fourth shrine, and in that, this is the fourth shrine. These wonderful photographs here of him looking into the last shrine to find a quartzite sarcophagus. And this is what we saw in the tomb. This was standing in the burial chamber of the tomb. This, of course, was taken after they removed all of the pieces of the shrines. Beautiful quartzite sarcophagus, actually not made for Tutankhamun. The official publication of this, the title is The Sarcophagus in the Tomb of Tutankhamun. So it's not Tutankhamun's sarcophagus. It was possibly made for Nefer Nefertiti or for one of the daughters. There's a lot of reuse we'll talk about. But spectacular piece showing the four titulary goddesses that protect the um, organs of the body with their wings outspread, protecting the king's body that was in this sarcophagus. The lid, by the way, not shown there, they broke in antiquity, trying to put it down on top of the, there was a little sloppiness. They were, they were obviously working pretty fast when they were uh, completing this tomb. He took <coughs> the lid off of the sarcophagus, and inside he saw a mummy-shaped coffin covered with, again, a, a linen pole. He took the linen off it and discovered this spectacular, very large uh, wood sarcophagus covered in gold. This is what we saw in the tomb. It was lying in the, in the sarcophagus. The, the coffin was inside the sarcophagus. That's what we saw. It shows Tutankhamun as the god Osiris, his hands crossed as, as, a, as if a mummy, carrying a crook and the flail, the two major um, scepters of the king. Really spectacular piece. Look at this little floral wreath that was placed there at the time of the burial. Lots and lots of flowers 
fresh, what were for fresh flowers with this. He opened this coffin to find inside another coffin. This one, again, with a linen pole, lots of flowers over this one. Another nice little wreath of flowers over the cobra and vulture on the forehead. He cleared that away to find this. The second coffin, again, wood. Most of the color is glass. Glass was very precious in ancient Egypt. There is some carnelian. But spectacular image of Tutankhamun as the god Osiris. And you can see these feather patterns. Again, the king is supposed to be enveloped in the protective wings of goddesses. And so you have all these wings shown in different colors of glass. Again, with the crook and the flail, the cobra and vulture, which symbolizes the heat, rules both, mother, both northern and southern Egypt. A couple interesting things he's shown with pierced ears, which is odd because adult men did not wear pierced ear, uh, did not wear earrings during this period. Only when they're adolescents do they wear um, uh, pierced ears, or do they wear earrings. But incredible detail and almost perfect. These fabulous photographs of Carter working here, brushing off the second coffin while it's still sitting in the trough or base of the first coffin. And here the very laborious process of pulling the second coffin out of the first coffin. Very difficult. There was a lot of unguent that acted as an adhesive, not a lot of room to work between these two. So what he actually did is he um, secured the second coffin and then was made, was he attached bolts to the first coffin and he actually lowered the first coffin away from the second coffin. It was the only way he was able to do it. So very clever engineering and very, very tight space as you can see. And so here, an image of the second coffin, he opened that to find yet another coffin, a third coffin. And here again with a linen pole and lots and lots of flower, flowers on it. This coffin was solid gold. The others were wood overlaid with gold and with glass and uh, semi-precious stones, primarily carnelian. But this was the innermost coffin. It weighs something like 120 kilos of gold. And you can see it, it's got the original handles. It's got little places to, uh, to put silver nails in to close it, because it's a mortise and tendon sort of closing. The eyes, the eye inlays did not survive, unfortunately, in this. But a spectacular piece of big, disc necklace, it's called a Cheviu collar, which is a special collar of, uh, of honor, but the same iconography, the, the, uh, the crook and the flail and the cobra and the vulture, but here done in solid gold, but again the same iconography of him being completely uh, enfolded in the wings of the protective goddesses. He opened this coffin to find the body of the king, but what was most extraordinary was over the head and shoulders of the mummy was this spectacular large gold mass, one of the greatest archaeological discoveries ever, discoveries ever, an absolutely iconic piece for ancient Egypt. Here, picture of it in color. It is made of several pieces of gold that has been hammered. Again, most of this is colored glass, which is not to say it's a cheap cheapy version. Glass was very precious and it was easy to work in this period, but this is real carnelian and some amethyst. Most, most people don't get to see the back of it. This is what it looks like. It has a Book of the Dead inscription on the back, but absolutely fabulous, fabulous piece. It was very difficult to clear this because, again, uh, the priests had poured a tremendous amount of perfume and unguent over the body and through the coffins to purify it. And these hardened, making it very, very difficult for Carter to separate the pieces of this burial assemblage. The body was completely covered with jewelry. For example, here are the arms, the crossed arms of the mummy, and here you can see again these number cards for keeping track of what's what. So this is the crossed arm of the mummy. And here they, they put the, the bracelets so you can see this is one arm and then the opposite arm to give you an idea of the amount of material that was on this mummy. Here's just one of those bracelets, uh, uh, one of the pair of bracelets with these enormous uh, lapis lazuli uh, scarabs, just absolute masterpieces of Egyptian jeweler's art. 
other things from the mummy. These beautiful, flexible collars. There were about six of them looped around the neck, different sizes, different colors. And on the head was a diadem, a crown. A really elegant, beautiful thing with um, olive gold, of course. This is actually hinge. These are hinge. These are like tails that go down the back. And the cobra and vulture, of course, which symbolizes rule over northern and southern Egypt. This is the zigzaggy tail of the cobra. A spectacular piece. Again, more pictures of the body. This, this, just clearing the body, the mummy, was like its own archaeological project because there were so many layers of wrappings, and between each layer of wrappings was a whole other set of jewelry. So here, for example, we have gold collars that were just placed on the body, um, <laughs> beaded, beaded material. But the things like this, a spectacular gold <coughs> dagger that some of you may have seen. This has traveled before with really beautiful uh, granulation. Very interesting for our knowledge of Egyptian technology. There were two of these on the body, one in iron and one in gold. <coughs> then turning to the next chamber, if you're, <coughs> if you're in the burial chamber, as we were looking, if you look to the right, there was a low doorway. And that led to a room called the Treasury. And this was also absolutely incredible. This is as it looked when Carter first went into it. Guarding the entrance was a large statue of the god Anubis, the jackal god of embalming, sitting on a carrying uh, palaquin. So you can see the, the carrying poles. So this thing could be placed on the shoulders of priests and carried to and from the tomb. Again, wrapped in linen, a lot of them. But look at this, like what a mess, what a fabulous mess. Just hundreds and hundreds of things just stashed and thrown, complete disorder. In the back of the room, very, very important, shown here, was the canopic material. If you remember in mummification, they take, they take out the stomach, liver, lungs, and intestines, and they want to mummify them separately and put them in the tube with the, with the mummy, because the mummy's going to need it. Well, there were examples of royal canopic chests known, but it would never that never before had been preserved an entire canopic assemblage from this period. By the way, the period of Tut is, a, is like a Baroque period in ancient Egypt. Fabulous wealth, it's the apogee of its economic holdings. So this is reflected, this is like wretched excess is what we're looking at with this tube. So in the back we can see this, this large wooden chest with rearing cobras, this beautiful little box, and around the sides four different goddesses with our hands outheld, protecting the contents of that box. Within that shrine, Carter found a fabulous calcite chest. It's about maybe about three and a half feet tall. Again, with the goddesses at the edges protecting the contents of the jar. When he opened that, this is one of the Harry Burton photographs, of course. These wonderful four little stoppers, there are recesses cut. So this is a solid block of, of quartz of calcite, and there are recesses cut in it. And so these are the stoppers for each of the recesses in the box. These really just heartrending, beautiful little images of presumably King, King Tutankhamun, or at least a royal person from this time. Really fabulous pieces. And this is what it looked like after he took those stoppers off, looking down. And here you can see the heads of the receptacles that held the stomach, the liver, lungs, and intestines, respectively. And this is what they look like. They were miniatures of the second coffin. Absolutely spectacular, made out of solid gold. They're about 14 inches tall, completely encrusted with glass. Just absolute masterpieces. And four of them, instead of one of them, there are four of them. So the embarrassment of riches of this tomb was just absolutely spectacular. In that same chamber were many, many boxes that contained statues. All of these sorts of things had statues usually wrapped in linen, types of statues that had never been known, or at least were known only from images of them in other royal tombs. For example, this one you see here is this. Mm. A ruler standing on the back of a panther. And then 
if you're standing where we were in the tomb, the burial chamber is to the right. Off to the left, you can barely see it because the body of the king was there. There's a very low doorway into another room called the annex. And this room was even more of a mess. It was completely disorderly. This is what it looked like. Of course, this is the first layer of photo cards they put. But here you can see they're just throwing, throwing the furniture, just stacking it up completely without any order. Some wonderful things. This is a specially done case for, for bows, for archery bows. So you can see it's sort of triangular for the king's bows. The king's bows were beautiful with gold and different types of ornamentation. So you have to appreciate how difficult it was to clear this tomb. It was like a big game of really expensive pickup sticks, really ancient pickup sticks. And some of the types of objects from this chamber. This is a perfume jar. It's about 21 inches tall. As I said, at the time of Tutankhamun was a period of tremendous sort of brokenness. It's like really over the top. Everything's super decorated, super ornamented. And another piece from this, if you go back, uh, I don't see that picture, but I hear from that same stack of stuff, a box here and its lid over here. This is a wooden box covered with sheets of ivory that have been painted. These beautiful scenes of Tutankhamun and his wife, Queen Aksanaman, in a garden and in scenes of him, allegorical scenes of him. Well, a question that's asked is there's so much stuff in this tomb. When was this made? When did they have a chance to make all this stuff? Because Tutankhamun died when he was about 18 or 19. He was on the throne only eight or nine years. Presumably, he died very unexpectedly because he's such a young man. So how did they have a chance to make all this stuff? What it looks like is it's a combination of things. There are things that he actually used during his lifetime. There are things that were made during the time he was on the throne in anticipation of his death that were put in storage. But it's also clear that whoever supervised this burial is taking a lot of stuff from earlier burials, immediate uh, uh, burials like Nefertiti, maybe Nefertiti's daughter. So a lot of the stuff is not original to Tutankhamun, but we see it being modified to put his name on it. So for example, remember those gold mini coffins that hold the, hold the canopic material? If on the inside they have the name Tutankhamun, if you look carefully, it actually, that's written over the name Smenkar Ray, his brother, who predeceased him. So they're, exor they're taking things from the earlier burials and then putting them in Tut's tomb. Other examples of that, uh, for example, this spectacular lion-headed throne, wood, covered in gold. The back has this fabulous scene of what looks like, or well, according to the inscriptions, is Tutankhamun and his wife, Aung San Aman. Some careful study of this shows this was originally made for Akhenaten and Nefertiti, and modified. So we don't know if this was something that was, a, excuse me, that was in Akhenaten and Nefertiti's palace that Tutankhamun loved so much that he had taken from their capital city and had it changed. Maybe he used it and then it was put in his tomb. Or we don't know exactly what time it was changed for him. But this was definitely not originally for Tutankhamun. These statues, a series of these, are possibly for Nefertiti. In the Amarna period, you do have very sort of feminine features with males, but some of these are too female. So we think some of these were not originally Tutankhamun. Some of these are either for his um, half-sisters or for Nefertiti. This is one of the pieces, by the way, that was stolen from the Egyptian Museum in the Revolution. Some things, as I mentioned, were made for him when he was a child and were kept and put in the tomb. For example, he had two sets of these spectacular scepters, just like the ones you saw on the coffins. This set is small. It's a child's size set. And in fact, the bottom caps have the early form of his name because Tutankhamun changed his name from Tudong Aten to Tudong Amu. So this set says Tudong Aten, this set, the grown up set, is Tudong Amu. This is the grown up set. Really beautiful, beautiful material. So some of these things were, in fact, his, his material when he was a kid. This is a, this is a child sized ch chair. It's a little tiny chair as opposed to an adult sized chair. So we assume that this was something that Tutankhamun had actually used in his lifetime. Well, you look at all this stuff and you think, well, what would, thank you, John. What did they steal when you see what they left? 
quote, clearly the robbers did not have a lot of time to go through the tomb. But the two things they were definitely after were small portable gold objects, and this sounds kind of weird, but perfume. Perfume, which was like a gummy substance, like a, like a sort of like Crisco, almost in, text, text, uh, in consistency, was very, very expensive in ancient Egypt. And the thing that's very important to think about when you're talking about the theft of the perfumes is Egyptian perfume goes rancid. So if it's been in a tomb for a generation, they're not going to go after it because it can be no good. So this is another indication we know this tomb was robbed very soon after the tomb was, uh, was sealed. Things that were stolen, for example, this gold shrine I showed you, there should be a solid gold statue standing there. It's gone. So again, smaller gold portable objects. This is a perfume jar oops, from the tomb. And I was able to, when I was doing some studies with this, you can look down the neck of it, and this doesn't show so well here, but you can actually see the marks where they used a tool and scrape the perfume out of the jar. The larger ones, you can actually see the fingerprints of the robbers where they went in with their hands and just scooped the stuff out and put it in, into bags, presumably carried out of the tomb. Another thing that was very poignant was the set of five rings, gold rings, that Carter did, discovered wrapped up in, in a just ratty piece of linen that was like thrown against a corner. So we think probably this is the kind of stuff the robbers had gathered up. They put it in a piece of linen to make it portable, and they were discovered at the time they were trying to rob the tomb, so they just dropped it, or they were forced to rob it. Other things that they were after were other, there's a lot of gold um, leaf in this tomb. For example, this is a, a stool, and very typical for this period, this is that intertwining of the papyrus and lotus around this central uh, hieroglyph, which means to unify. So it says may upper and lower Egypt be unified. So this is an intact stool, but look what happened here. The, the robbers just wrenched all of that gold-plated wood out of the lower part of this, of this chair. So I hope that gives you just a little idea of how incredible this discovery was. The material is still being studied, by the way. There are still volumes coming out. If you're interested in learning more about Tutankhamun, Howard Carter's records are kept at the Griffith Institute at, um, at Cambridge, Cambridge University. They have a fabulous site for Tutankhamun. It is so much fun to surf it. They have all of Carter's notes. They have all of Burton's photographs. It's really, really a, a great source if you're interested in Tutankhamun. So be happy to take any questions. Yeah. Who's the legal owner of all of these? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. Who is the legal owner of all this stuff? Well, there's a good story. Because at the time Carter and Carnarvon began their excavations, just like anybody else who was working in Egypt, they had to sign a, a contract with the Egyptian government that said what they're going to do, where they're going to work, who's going to be working there. And that contract, countersigned by the government and by them, stipulated what would happen to, what, to artifacts. Their particular contract said, OK, they're working the Valley of the Kings. If they find an intact tomb, royal tomb, because it is intact, everything will stay in Egypt, because they didn't want to divide it. So it really needed to be kept together for the full context. So they discovered the tomb of Tutankhamun. Well, is it intact, or is it robbed? Because it was robbed 3,000 years before the time they bought it. Of course, Carter and Carnarvon are arguing, hey, this is, a, this is a robbed tomb. You have to share it with us. And the Egyptians are saying, no dice. No, absolutely no dice. This became a really, really big problem. Howard Carter was not a very easy man to deal with. He was also um, kind of unhinged because about a year into the excavations, Lord Carnarvon died of a, uh, of a uh, he had an uh, infected mosquito bite. He was a very ill man. He actually went to Egypt first because of his health. He was injured in a car crash. And back then, the doctor said, no, go to Egypt for your health. So there was a huge, huge legal battle about this. In 1925, in 1925, so several years into the excavation of the tomb, Carter and the government, the Egyptian government, just completely had a meltdown. And it was over something silly. It was over who should be allowed to visit the tomb. Carter wanted to have complete control over who should come, be able to come to the tomb. It's reasonable. He's working. It's a work site. But he turned down some like wives of Egyptian diplomats or something like that. And, he, and that was just the straw that broke the camel's back. It was so bad that the Egyptian authorities came, as they were entitled to, 
and they locked Carter out of the tomb. They oh. changed his lock, put their own locks, and said, you're done. This was really bad, because that was when they were separating the second and third coffins, and what, the second coffin was actually suspended on ropes in mm -hmm. midair. It's like, you don't want to leave it like that. It took about a year and a half, took almost two years to resolve this. And um, James Henry Breskin, who I keep on referring to, the founder of the Oriental Institute, was very well respected in, in Egypt as being a fair-minded individual, very good relations with Western colleagues and with the Egyptians. And he was actually called in to be the mediator between the Egyptians and the Carnarvon estate because it was just vile. It was, Carter was printing this inflammatory stuff and publishing it because he was locked out of the tomb. He used that as an opportunity to go on these very successful lecture tours through Europe and the United States just slamming the Egyptians. You know, it was, it was just, he didn't make it easy for anybody. So Breasted was able to talk everybody down, and ultimately all of the material did stay in Egypt, as was stipulated in that contract. And the Egyptians did argue, and it was accepted, that although the tomb had been robbed, it was essentially intact because it had been robbed so soon after it had been buried. So the material is all in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Good excuse to go back. Is there a vote? Uh, for easy thing versus why is there more not more painting on the walls? Probably because the burial took place very very quickly, and this was not initially this was not supposed to be Tutankhamun's tomb, so they just they put it, it was like a slapdash thing. They just painted that one room. The other is about DNA. Are, are they doing testing? It, well, the DNA um, capture. Of Ancient DNA for specimens as old as Egypt, the best place is to get it out of the uh, pulp of teeth or long bones. But it's it's debated, but um, we're, I'm working with a group at the University of Chicago on DNA recovery from our collections. And they also say that there's been really very, very inconsistent and not very successful recovery of DNA from Egyptian mummies. You can get, there are two kinds of DNA, and if there are physicians here, correct me if I'm completely wrong. There's mitochondrial, which can trace the female line, and there's nucleic, which traces the female, the male line. They can get long enough strands of nucleic to make some sense, but the mitochondrial, the other one, which is very important for a lot of our studies, excuse me, it's the reverse. Mitochondrial is for the females, and nucleic is, never mind. I'm an Egyptologist, not a, uh, it's, it's in its infancy, and people debate whether there's been really any successful DNA studies. So Egypt, about 15 years ago, did this big deal with National Geo, of course, for maximum publicity, about testing the DNA of Tut and CAT scanning Tut. And this is where we got all of these different ideas of the cause of Tut's death, most of them very inconclusive, and most of them really not accepted well by the scientific community. So people are still experimenting with DNA, but it is still not very functional for ancient Egyptian. And it's apparently not the age. It, it may have something to do with the chemicals in involving. He's like the Ice Man. You know, the Ice Man, they did DNA. He's much older, much, much older. Carnarvon was putting money into the Egyptian work. What did they get out of it? His family and Carter? I mean, uh, you, you lectured to us, but surely they had to get some monetary. To, the question is, what did the, the Carnarvon estate get out of all of this? And he's putting a lot of money into these excavations. What does he get out of it? He gets fame. He gets glory. He's a, a very famous man as a result. And in theory, you know, you do excavations not for the goodies, but for the recovery of data and the furtherance of science. So, but what he did get was a lot of money out of those uh, contracts with the uh, with the London Illustrated News. So there was a lot of money sloshing around, and there were some issues with minor objects migrating out of the tomb. Okay. A few problems with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised in the documentation pictures up here there were no scales in here. They're just a photograph, but no, nothing to give the dimensions of it. Or there's, uh, That's a photos. very good observation. It is, although all of this care with black and white photography and the number cards to key right. things, there are no scales in the photographs. And I. I'm not sure if Burton used any scales, if that's just a newer, if that's, a, it's, it's something we take completely for granted now. 
And that's an interesting thing, to go back and look at some of the less staged things and see if there are scales in any of them. Because Herter, who of course began as an artist, has these beautiful drawings of each of the objects with very careful measurements and that kind of stuff, but still you expect a scale in the photograph. Also, the conservation was very difficult because a lot of this material they, they'd never seen before. And the big issue, of course, there was so much gold over wood. And over the thousands of years, the wood had shrunk. So it's usually wood and then a layer of gesso, like plaster, and then the gold and then the decoration. So this was really tough, how you keep it all together. So the main system they used is they doused most stuff in paraffin because it kept everything together. And so successive generations of conservators have been taking a lot of para paraffin off things. But it was, it was a great solution for the time being. Maybe one more question, Dr. Norma? The question is, who, is the rob who, were, who, who were the robbers, and is there been any attempt to? We assume the robbers were people who were involved in building the tomb, or in bringing the things to the tomb. And we used to say that because, oh, they knew where the tomb was. Well, as I've told many of you, there's no way you can keep a tomb like this secret, because that big white fan tail of the excavated limestone, pure white limestone that was disturbed, so there's no question. It looks like a big arrow leading to the entrance of the tomb, even if you bury the tomb. But we assume it was people involved, because it was very soon afterward. We don't know. I mean, there are a thousand scenarios, because there were guards that patrolled the Valley of the Kings. It could have been them. Yeah, somebody could have bribed those guards. We, we simply, we simply don't know. And again, we don't really know what was taken out of the tomb. Thank you very much.